Thank you so much, sir, for the kind introduction. It's a great honor and privilege to be here. It's like homecoming for me. And um, I'll be talking about, uh, so throughout last two days, we have been discussing about AKIs and the kidney injuries. But we need to understand the tools to diagnose them, tools to diagnose them early and to act upon the diagnosis in an orderly manner. So the problem statement is creatinine is not sufficient, urine output is not sufficient because the creatinine is telling us about the kidney function, not the kidney damage or the kidney injury happening. So the quest for last so many decades is for a kidney troponin that will tell us a story about kidney injury before the kidney function goes down and help us act on it. So the ADKI meeting has also proposed for uh, applying a biomarker to assess the patient at risk for AKI progression. So now we are at a stage when we want something better than creatinine, something better than drop in urine output to help us identify patients who are at risk of developing acute kidney injury in their course of illness. When we talk of a biomarker, the biggest challenge is the cost of biomarker. And when we say a biomarker, it is not only one-time testing. We need to test it at multiple times during the course of the illness to understand exactly the kidney injury that is happening underneath the health of the patient. Then what is the sensitivity and specificity of biomarker being tested? So there is a plethora of biomarkers, more than say 300 molecules uh, discovered up till now, but there is a debate and there is no consensus based on their sensitivity and specificity to pick up the acute kidney injury beforehand. And lastly, we need to understand that our decisions need to be based on the results. It's not, it cannot be a theoretical estimation of the biomarker in the urine or the blood that will go on in the disease trajectory, but the decision making should be based on the results of the biomarker. So these are all the challenges and to the base of it, we, I, I would say it is the cost of the biomarker testing. I would add one more dimension to the cost restraint is the knowledge dissemination. The knowledge dissemination, once it reaches to the many parts of the country where we are into the acute kidney care or acute care, then only the use of biomarkers and therapies based on the biomarker will take a boost. So uh, the cost of biomarker will going up and the knowledge dissemination going down will actually worsening the resources and enhancing the resource constraints. With this, I will just take you back to the journey of biomarkers and I, I will just try to, um, uh, try to tell you how the biomarkers have evolved up till now. So we are looking at the biomarkers for multiple, multiple purposes. We want them to tell us the etiology of AKI, we want to tell them the differential diagnosis of AKI and as well as we need to tell them the location of the injury, I mean the anatomical location of injury, whether it is glomerular proximal tubular or the connecting duct. So all these things we need to understand from the biomarkers. And this will be the, this will define the utility of the particular biomarker. So they can be utilized for AKI risk assessment, for the prediction and prevention of the impending severe degree of AKI, as well as to understand the diagnosis, the etiology and the management based on it. So what are the different types of biomarker? I would, I would differentiate it into two categories. One, those are produced outside the kidney, those produced inside the kidney. So an individual has an insult like a nephrotoxic drug, ischemia, hypotension, sepsis and all that. Some substances are produced in the kidneys and some substances are produced outside the kidneys and they are very common like creatinine and cystatin C. They come to the kidney and we look at the filtering ability of the kidney of these molecules. So that tells us the function of the kidney. So these are all functional biomarkers. On the other hand, we have molecules like NGAL, KIM1, TIMP2, IJBP7 product. So these are actually released by the kidney tissue on injury and we catch them in the blood or in the urine and they are called the injury biomarkers. So we have a contest between the functional biomarkers and the injury biomarkers to tell us the kidney status. And just to have the, um, the uh, these many biomarkers in front of you. I will revisit this slide again. But these are the biomarkers which are most talked about. We have NGAL, we have uh, urinary IL-18, KIM-1, TIMP-2, IJBP-7, LFAB and so on and so forth. And uh, I'll revisit this slide, but we have multiple options. I would say more than 300. With this, um, um, the ADKI meeting thought of uh, 
having a biomarker which will tell us and help us diagnose acute kidney injury before the rise of creatinine and drop in the urine output. And this was called as subclinical AKI. So now we have, uh, we have a classification of AKI based on functional biomarkers and injury biomarkers. So the functional criteria is based on the age old creatinine and urine output and, and uh, biomarkers or injury biomarkers are come into play to tell us the injury pattern of the kidneys. And this is not only meant for the stages, but they will subclassify the stages into, for example, stage 1 will be subclassified into stage 1S, stage 1A and stage 1B. So stage 1S is biomarker positive state. So where we have no rise in creatinine and no decrease in urine output. So this is of particular interest because we want to catch patients in this particular stage before the damage has become advanced and may be irreversible. And then we need to understand how to reassess the patients based on biomarker. So biomarker will tell us whether the kidney injury has become progressive, is it regressing or it has become static and chronic. So the progression we will have a positivity in the biomarker, the titers will be rising, increasing the creatinine and decreasing the urine output. At the same time, if the treatment is appropriate and the patient is responding to treatment, we will have a resolution. The resolution will be told by drop in the biomarker level earlier than the drop in the creatinine. So this is how we need to uh, redefine the staging system for acute kidney injury based on the novel injury biomarkers. With this, we have a biomarker integrated model of AKI. So acute kidney injury, now we look at a syndrome and we, we have this two by two model where we can have a biomarker positive and creatinine negative on the right upper limb, right upper quadrant. And right lower quadrant, we have a biomarker and creatinine both positive. So we have an injury as well as loss of function when we have rise in creatinine, rise in biomarker. But at the same time, if somebody is coming with a biomarker negativity and creatinine positivity, as we are seeing in the left lower corner, this is just a CKD which, with, with a rise in creatinine. So he may or may not have an AKI. So that is what is the thought process is all about. And this, this, uh, this biomarker dimension of uh, acute kidney injury has to be stressed to differentiate patients into one of these four quadrants. So now let us acknowledge that there is a subset of patients which are biomarker positive and creatinine negative. So this is a new category of AKI. And this new category of AKI is shown, this is a publication of 2011 um, 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 and the hospital mortality and RRT initiation, which were the major uh, outcome parameters used here, were all significantly higher in patients with biomarker positive, positivity. So the biomarker positivity is reflecting into a longer hospital stay and requirement dialysis. So this is what is the new dimension of diagnosis of AKI. Then we come to biomarker guided diagnosis and management. So now we are like having somebody to help creatinine identify AKI and help us manage these patients. We saw there is an injury biomarker and there is a functional biomarker. Now we are again talking about stress biomarker. So it is something before the injury has happened, out of which we can see the TIMP2 and IGFBP7 as the front runner. With this background, we uh, let us go to this uh, very uh, interesting study by Dr. Kashani and his group. Um, we know we need a biomarker. So the study was divided into two limbs. One was, first was the discovery limb, second was validation limb. In discovery limb, uh, the urine was collected and more than 300 protein moieties, more than 300 protein moieties were tested, which included NGAL, KIM1, LFAB, TIMP2, IJBP7, and they were tested for their ability to predict occurrence of AKI in the due course of time. And when this, all these molecules were tested head on, TIMP2 and IGFBP7 was proven to be superior in predicting the occurrence of AKI. Thus, this cell cycle arrest biomarker was then validated into a validation study and it was seen superior to all other biomarkers. So, we saw this slide earlier and among these biomarkers, 
at this point in time, the literature says that EIMP2 IGBB7 is the clear winner. When this hypothesis was generated, many studies came, came into picture. So investigator, they, they saw patients after major surgery, after cardiac surgery, after sepsis and septic shock and try to understand what happens to the TIMP2 IJBP7 level in the urine. So with this, we have studies like Prevaki, we have studies like Big Pack, and we have studies from Dr. Ronko's unit where, uh, where the Dr. Ronko's unit even developed an alarming system, which was an electronic alarm system in the urine where the physician or the nephrologist attending was alarmed whenever the, uh, the nephrocheck value or the TIMP2 IJBP7 value was going up. And this was an alarm to act upon and prevent occurrence of further renal injury. Let me tell you, this is all happening before the rise of creatinine and drop in urine output. So we are looking at that stage in the, in the trajectory of AKI. These studies also have um, made use of uh, nephrocheck biomarker to, um, as, as a guidance for, for therapy generation. And this was not only, uh, not only observational trials, what I am telling you is not only observation trials, but it has got some translational value. So the value which was generated, the nephrocheck biomarker value in the urine, translated into management these studies and investigators, they thought of bundles. So it was a protocolized approach. So in, for example, in big pack study, we have a bundle. Whenever you have a nephrocheck value of more than say 0 0.3, um, uh, all these things were deployed, like rise in, increase the map to more than 65. Uh, think of IVC diameter less than two, prevent nephrotoxin exposure, which draw drugs like uh, piplacillin, tazobactin, vancomycin, aminoglycoside, frusemide monitor the urine output. Same like in uh, Prevaki trial, where, where, where there is a bundle of its own. We have a KDGO, KDGO bundle also. These, these are all translational values, which are based on the um, uh, TIMP2 and IJBP7 levels. So this was something, a very, um, a very sea change in the management of AKI and understanding of the priorities during the management of AKI. When we looked at the different, uh, different results of different trials, which was conducted by different investigators in different cohorts of patients, like patients post-transplantation, patients after surgeries, patients after sepsis, patients after cardiac surgeries, we found that they have used multiple cutoff limits of nephrocheck. So this is not one ma there was no magic figure for nephrotic throughout the discovery. So for example, we have a nephrotic cutoff of 0 0.5. We have a cutoff of 1.39 for uh, for trans post transplant um, renal dysfunction, graft dysfunctions. But after putting all this data together, what the um, what, what consensus we had and what FD has approved is a cutoff limit of say 0 0.3. So we say low risk of AKI when the nephrocheck value is less than 0 0.3. We have a moderate risk between 0 0.3 to 2, and we have very high risk beyond 2. So these were the present day uh, accepted and acknowledged cutoff limits for uh, TIMP2 IJBP7, which is the nephrocheck biomarker. With this, uh, we, we, we started off using uh, staging of kidney injury. So can we stage kidney injury, like we have stages of 1, 2, and 3, can we substage the injuries? And that was also seen with some debate that the, if the cutoff limit is brought down to say 1, we can, we can identify multiple patients who are at risk of developing an AKI in the disease course. With this background, I will just like to share you what our experience of um, dealing with nephrocheck is. It is not still hit the market, Indian market is not hit. We started with a study in 2019, which uh, we call it as a BEMAKI study group. It is biomarker enhanced management of acute kidney injury. And uh, we looked at the nephrocheck values and uh, um, we, uh, we did not uh, uh, looked at patients with established AKI. We, we, it was a multicentric trial, out of which uh, Pune, Dr. Lobo's unit is one of the centers. It's pan India, where we, we intend to include a heterogeneous group of patients uh, with a good representation from the uh, north, east, south, and west. And it's an observational trial, and um, you know, likely outcomes are maybe hitting uh, by March 2023. We have a very simple study methodology. We have only three-staged approach. We screen the patients. 
whoever is entering into the ICU and likely to stay in the ICU for 48 hours, we screen the patients with a Malotra risk score. So I will reiterate that these are not established AKI patients. These are patients who are at risk of developing an AKI. Then we enroll these patients and once we enroll these patients, we see their nephrocheck in the urine at timed intervals, at, at fixed time intervals on day 1, day 3, day 7, day 15, day 30 and day 19. 90 days nephrocheck evaluation may be the first time we are doing it and we don't know how it will turn out but that's what the study methodology is. The risk assessment is based on a score. The score tells us about acute components as well as the chronic components and the total risk score is 21. We took 8 as a cutoff. So any patients coming to us with a risk score of 8 or more than 8 is enrolled into the study and is tested for the nephrocheck biomarker. And the accepted limits of 0 0.3, that's what we have also accepted. More than 3, we call positive. Less than 0.3, we call as negative. So total, almost 4,900 patients we could screen and out of which we could enroll more than 400 patients. And what we observed up till now is that out of 403, 202 patients have developed AKI at various stages. While 201, they have not developed AKI based on creatinine and urine output. We are yet to get the nephrocheck values which we'll be sharing with you shortly. And But what I want to suggest is that the Malota risk score was very high in those who are developing this AKI. So with all this background, we can see that the utility of TIMP2 and IGBP7 is not only in the predicting the risk, it is into pre preventing the occurrence of severe stages of AKI as well as monitoring the AKI progression. So we can have a rise in the nephrocheck during the disease course or we can have a drop in the nephrocheck during disease course and that will define whether the patient is progressing or worsening. The background kidney health is one aspect which we need to understand that the AKI occurring on the background of a CKD is worse than AKI occurring in, into a little in a healthier kidneys. And that is one of the independent risk marker what we saw in the Malotra risk score. And in these patients, we need to define the levels of the biomarker testing and which will translate into the biomarker based management. But the debate still continues. We need to understand the cost of testing the novel biomarkers vis-a-vis -vis the cost of managing AKDs and SCKDs. These are the consequences of AKI. So these two need to be put into a cost-effective cost effective manner and we, we need to have a consensus on, on how best we can proceed. With this, uh, I would like to conclude. So we have three dimensions to this. We need to check the AKI biomarkers, not randomly for all patients. We need to identify the at-risk patients for whom we offer AKI biomarkers. We need to test them early and we need to test them repeatedly. This leads us to interpreting the results for diagnostics, risk stratification and prognostication. This will translate into management. This, this is a grey area where I, I, won't be, uh, I won't be commenting much. We, we can develop some bundles like a protocolized approach for that particular unit for that particular set of population or we can have a personalized care based on the biomarker. But this will be the grey area where probably more data is needed. With that, I thank you all for your attention. Thank you.